Hi everyone, Joe Uden here, owner of Touring Israel Luxury Private Tours. And on today's video podcast, we have the Jerusalem Post correspondent for Palestinian Affairs, uh, Khaled Abu Tomech, who many of you know from our breakfast meetings when you're here in Israel. Uh, hello, Khaled. How are you today? Thank you. Fine, Joe. I'm okay. I mean, we're hanging out. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's it's good to see you, even if it's it's this way. You have a um, uh, an interesting background. Um, I know you were a producer for NBC News, the, the American NBC News, for about uh, 27 years, and uh, now you're writing for the Jerusalem Post. Um, why don't? But, but before we start um, on on our topic, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? How? When did you become a journalist? Where did you grow up? Uh, where do you live now? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, that, that should be easy. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been a, well, I mean, I've always wanted to be a, a reporter or a journalist. I remember, Joe, as a kid, uh, I was fighting with my brothers and sisters. They always wanted to watch uh, Tom and Jerry on TV. I always wanted to watch the news. Uh, and that's how it began. You know, you, it has to be in your blood. You have to really want it. Uh, so when I finished high school, uh, I found myself a job in a newspaper in East Jerusalem. I worked there for a, a number of years as a student. I was going to uh, Hebrew University back then. Uh, I worked for that newspaper for like five or six years. But then when I finished university, I did not go back to work for that paper. I went out to work with the international media, uh, helping them cover Palestinian issues. And that means, you know, uh, taking journalists to the West Bank and Gaza. I was for many years like your tour guide in the West Bank and Gaza. But instead of taking you to see a museum or a zoo uh, or some historic site, I would take you to see the PLO, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and meet all these people out there. And that's how I became uh, connected with NBC News already back in 1988 during the first Intifada. Uh, they hired my services to work for them uh, as a producer. We call it actually a fixer also. It's like, you know, oh, Khaled, can you get us an interview with the Hamas leader today? Oh, we'd like an interview with a, a PLO leader or someone. So that's my job. Uh, from TV, I also moved on to writing. I started writing also in uh, several newspapers about the Palestinians. Uh, for many years, I was writing for a magazine called the Jerusalem Report. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also writing in Hebrew for Yidot Ahronot, uh, Israel's uh, largest newspaper about the Palestinians. And for the last 20 years, my beat is the Palestinian issue at the Jerusalem Post. I'm sure you <clears throat> are all aware of this newspaper. It's older than Israel. It's been around for a long time. Uh, what I, I've been covering Palestinian issues for them for the last 20 years. Uh, of course, I can't go to Gaza anymore because I'm an Israeli citizen. I didn't talk a lot about my background, but I'm an Arab, I'm a Muslim, I'm a citizen of Israel, and I'm also called a Palestinian. I know it's confusing, but uh, we have a crisis of identity here. Right. Uh, I <clears throat> when, <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> when people usually ask me, I just say, look, I'm an... <clears throat> A citizen of Israel. That's what really matters. Uh, so that's more or less, you know, my story and what I've been doing uh, and how I, how I came to journalism. Okay. In, in addition to the issue of journalism for the last 20 or 25 years, I've also been speaking a lot to different groups, to different forums, to private uh, people about the Palestinians, uh, and the conflict in general. I've met, through your company, hundreds of uh, people, very interesting people, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, over breakfast, over lunch, sometimes over dinner, uh, to talk about the situation. 
uh, people like to hear my perspective because I think they don't always get a chance to sit with an Arab journalist who's out there in the field uh, telling the story as it is with no filtering, with uh, no borders, no, no limits, no restrictions. And I think that's what gives me a, a unique uh, uh, angle that I'm able to tell the story as it is. You know, I'm not a foreign journalist. I just tell it as it is. Right. And that, uh, that that's interesting. I, I wanted to quickly interject. I, I'm not going to do this so much, but but you, you, <clears throat> you had a nerve with me when I was talking with Maddie Friedman last week. He was a, a, working in the Jerusalem Bureau of, of AP, and he said he had to leave because the the AP was making him report from a, from a certain perspective. And, <clears throat> and one of the things I love about your work is you, you tell it ha as you see it, but have you ever run into that where the powers that be maybe at NBC or, wh or whoever you were working for uh, uh, at the time uh, came down to you and, and said, you know, your story, we, we didn't like the perspective of, of the story change it. Has, has that ever happened to you? I mean, let's put NBC on the side, but uh, I w I've also worked with hundreds of international reporters and media outlets during the last uh, three decades. And I can tell you that I do see a problem with the way the international media looks at this conflict. If I were to sum up my experiences with the international media, uh, I would tell you that what bothers me is that many of the foreign reporters who come here, they already come with this belief that there's a conflict going on in the Middle East. In that conflict, there are good people and bad people. And it's like, Khalid, please stop confusing us with the facts. <laughs> what also worries me is that many of my foreign colleagues wake up in the morning and they ask me if I can help them find a story that reflects badly on Israel. And I can tell you, you know, of many cases that I've run into where stories that I have offered to my foreign colleagues were rejected, uh, sometimes politely, sometimes impolitely, simply because they did not have an anti-Israel angle to them. And I always used to tell my colleagues, look, it's not about being pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. Mm -hmm. Let's be fair and balanced in our reporting. If you want to criticize Israel, let's say for one week, okay. But aren't there, any, aren't there other things happening also on the other side, on the Palestinian side? I'm not saying Israel should not be criticized, but there are also tons of stories on the Palestinian side that are being ignored, deliberately ignored, I would say, uh, by the international media. And this, of course, is doing Israel a lot of injustice. Uh, and that's why I actually lost most of my work with the international media in the last three decades, because I dare to challenge the narrative that this is not a conflict between good guys and bad guys. And there are things happening in the West Bank and Gaza that are not receiving any attention from the media. You know, Joe, if I'm going to give you an example, I remember immediately after the signing of the Oslo Accords, and after the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, we started hearing all these stories about financial corruption in the Palestinian Authority. Mm -hmm. People were coming to me, including senior officials from the PLO, and saying, Khalid, the international aid is going into the wrong hands. Palestinians are being deprived of the international aid. Yasser Arafat and his cronies are mishandling or mismanaging the affairs of the Palestinians, the financial affairs. In other words, people were saying Arafat and company are stealing our money. Mm 
-hmm. Now, when I came to many of my foreign colleagues, including some big shots in America, in Europe, I'm, we're talking about Middle East uh, 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 heads of uh, bureau, you know, uh, Middle East correspondents for major organizations. When I came to them and I said, look, there are all these reports about financial corruption in the PLO. Some of them asked me, are you on the payroll of the Jewish lobby? <laughs> Others asked me, excuse me, did Jews give you money to say these things about this poor, peace-loving man, our hero, Yasser Arafat? And I was like, excuse me, no. What do the Jews have to do with this? I don't understand. I mean, I'm telling you what Palestinians are saying. I'm telling you what PLO people are even saying, that there is corruption. But as I said, these stories were ignored. I'm not right. saying all the media was like that, but I'm sorry to tell you, perhaps 95% of the mainstream media in the West chose to turn a blind eye to what was happening. Now, why is this an important issue? First of all, it's American and European taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. You would expect an American or a European journalist who is sitting here uh, to hold the Palestinian Authority accountable. Why? Because it's their money, right? Mm -hmm. It's money coming from their country. It's their taxpayer money. Right. Uh, but again, they did not want to, uh, to report about these things. They did not want to look at them because some of the journalists thought that this could be seen as Israeli propaganda. Others probably did not want to anger the Palestinian Authority or get into trouble with them. You know, there are various reasons uh, why that was happening. Now, point number two, why this was very important was because we, the journalists, actually betrayed our mission. What does that mean? Had these foreign journalists back then reported about what was happening in the Palestinian Authority, the corruption, the mismanagement, it's possible that their governments would have come in to, to Yasser Arafat and banged on the table and said, excuse me, sir, can you please start st stop stealing our money? Can you please start investing our money for the welfare of your people? Had they done that, we would have been in a much better situation today. Right. One of the reasons why the Palestinian Authority or its largest faction, Fatah, lost the 2006 election, the parliamentary election, was because of corruption. Right. So in other words, had the journalists done their job, their governments would have known about the corruption and their people also. And they would have come to Yasser Arafat and demanded accountability. And that would have prevented Hamas from coming to power. You see how important it was? Right. But and now again, Hamas is in power. And it seems to me like they're doing the same thing. They're taking all that hundreds of millions of dollars in international aid. And it's it's not really getting to the people still. And it, that's what I see. Are, are, is this being reported today? Uh, look, Joe, today I would say that in the last 10 or 12 years, there has been an improvement. Okay. Uh, for the first time, we began to see uh, foreign donors uh, requiring accountability, uh, holding the Palestinian Authority to account, uh, mm -hmm. demanding to see where their money was going. Uh, so there has been an improvement. I'm not saying there is no more corruption. I'm just saying that if in the past... Uh, there was, let's say, 90% corruption. Today, there is probably 40% corruption, which is actually good, which means we have made progress. Right. The Palestinian Authority, you have, to, you have to bear in mind, the Palestinian Authority is not a real government. It, it functions more like a, a group of organizations and private companies. Some Palestinians, by the way, call it a mafia. Okay. <laughs> 
Because it's not really very clear. But I would say that there is an improvement. Right. Uh, and, and that is good. But we need more. We need more mechanisms to follow up uh, on, the, on where the money is going. Right. Uh, there are certain countries and certain organizations that are now demanding or telling the Palestinian Authority, look, we will fund a project, but we will do it directly and not through you. And that's where some Palestinian officials find a problem because they don't get their share. Right. Their commission, we call it. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, well, then that, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the um, in the Palestinian territories in the West Bank and in Gaza. Uh, uh, right now, we're in the midst of this coronavirus. Uh, how are the Palestinians handling uh, this very serious uh, situation? Well, when we, when we talk about the Palestinians, you have to bear in mind that we're talking about two different or separate states or mini states. Mm -hmm. There's one in Gaza and there's another one in, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, the one in Gaza is run by Hamas. We have uh, two million Palestinians living there. Uh, so far, there have been 15 cases of coronavirus uh, in Gaza. Okay. And that's, of course, a, a very tiny number. Uh, Hamas says that the reason is because uh, it, has impo it has taken severe measures uh, in the Gaza Strip. For example, uh, anyone who returns to the Gaza Strip through Egypt uh, is forced into quarantine for 21 days. Okay. Uh, so Hamas has been able to stop the uh, coronavirus cases already at the border. It has managed to stop these people from uh, mixing with other Palestinians in Gaza. You know, there was a lot of fear that if there is a major outbreak in Gaza, that would be a disaster and these people will come and knock on Israel's door and ask for help. And even some Israeli officials I've been talking to uh, especially in the defense ministry, were initially very worried about the possibility that, you know, hundreds or thousands of people mm -hmm. would rush towards the border with Israel mm -hmm. asking for help if there is a major outbreak in, in Gaza. But today, I would say more than a month after the first cases were detected in Gaza, the situation is relatively good. Uh, all the uh, fears of, uh, you know, a major outbreak have not materialized. And that's good news. It's good news, by the way, for Israel, for uh, the people in Gaza, and even for the Egyptians, who also have a shared border with, uh, with, uh, with Gaza. And uh, now in the West Bank, we've seen that, you know, it's a different case. We have the Palestinian Authority over there. There are over 300 cases that have been confirmed. Uh, in uh, the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority claims that uh, at least 70% of these cases were of workers who went to Israel and came back to, to their families carrying we, the virus. You can see the numbers up here on the screen for... That. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about... Uh, the first one, I mean, the Palestinian Authority includes East Jerusalem in its statistics. So okay. I don't know if this figure is accurate, by the way, but they're saying 111 people in East Jerusalem were infected. Then uh, in, in, uh, in the West Bank, 307 cases. Uh, uh, so altogether, they're talking, and sorry, in Gaza, there were 13 now. This morning, they, we got another two, so it's actually 15. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's, what's also encouraging about these uh, figures, and we're talking about very low figures, because in the West Bank, we have uh, uh, less than 2 million people living there, Palestinians. So I don't know the exact number. I don't think anyone knows. But we're talking about three fatalities, three people who have died, three Palestinians. And uh, that's, uh, you know, in many ways, very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And the Palestinian Authority is saying, look, it's because of the very strict measures that we took, uh, lockdowns, uh, uh, 
on major cities, uh, the closure of uh, many villages. And there has been, to a certain extent, some cooperation, some compliance on the part of, uh, of Palestinians. Uh, we've seen that the Palestinian Authority has deployed uh, thousands of policemen and policewomen uh, all over the West Bank. And, uh, uh, you know, they're banning, they're, they're, they're effectively imposing a curfew mm-hmm. on people over there. Uh, and what I hear from Palestinians living there, and I go there almost every day, is that the measures that the Palestinian Authority is taking are much harsher than the measures that Israel is taking. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> as someone told me in Ramallah, he said, look, you don't mess with the Palestinian police mm-hmm. because they're not the IDF. Uh, <laughs> you know, if they arrest you, yeah, if they arrest you, you can't hire a lawyer and that's or right. go to a green court and complain. <laughs> if right. they arrest you, that's it, you know. So people are very careful. It's an iron fist policy. But I, uh, on the other hand, it's actually, you know, uh, proving to be uh, very successful. And many people are giving credit to uh, the prime minister, Muhammad Ishtayi. You know, in recent years, many people the, used to ask me. The one. Maybe John, oh, there he is. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. <clears throat> Many people used to ask me in the last uh, few years, what will happen uh, if and when Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, uh, steps down or dies? Uh, who will succeed him? Mm-hmm. And it, it seems that in, in the coronavirus uh, crisis has actually boosted the chances of the prime minister, Muhammad Ishtaye, to replace or to succeed uh, Abu Mazen. Many Palestinians are praising uh, Shtayi's performance. Uh, They like his daily briefings to the uh, press. They say that they feel there is transparency on the part of the Palestinian government. They see a charismatic man leading the fight against the uh, you know, the virus, they see him holding daily meetings and they even see him uh, talking to the people as a father figure. And all this is taking place while Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen uh, has vanished from the public, from public life. Abu Mazen is 84 years old uh, with many underlying conditions, uh, you know, illnesses. And since the beginning of the crisis, he has been in self-isolation. And the, the only uh, person that, uh, or the only leader that Palestinians see is Muhammad Ishtayye. Now, Muhammad Ishtayye, as opposed to Yasser Arafat, it, sorry, to Mahmoud Abbas, is, is relatively young. Mahmoud Ishtayye mm-hmm. is 62 years old. He's seen as a representative of the young guard now. And he's seen as a charismatic figure who is very powerful and the man doing his job. And some people even give him credit for uh, preventing the spread of the virus. Uh, They're saying, wow, you know, we only have three cases uh, or three fatalities. That's relatively good. We were expecting much more. So uh, I would say that for now, it looks as if uh, Muhammad Ishtayi, who was also a senior member of the ruling Fatah faction, uh, he has boosted or strengthened his chances of succeeding uh, Abu Mazen, uh, you know, if and when uh, we see a change of guard in the Palestinian Authority. Right. So that's good to hear. Um, So here we can see in the West Bank um, some people in hazmat suits and ambulances. Do the Palestinians have all the equipment they need to deal with a, a more serious outbreak if, if and does it there if there is one well in the west bank uh, palestinians are saying that their medical services are coping for now with the uh, with the crisis uh, they say that they have probably 200 or 250 uh, ventilators and uh, What's good is that they haven't been forced to use many of them so far. 
They're also talking about uh, 72 Palestinians who have already recovered. They were diagnosed in the beginning, then they were... Uh, so I don't hear from Palestinian officials in the West Bank that they're very worried for now. First of all, they really don't expect a major outbreak. And they're saying, even if there is a major outbreak, our hospitals, they have uh, <clears throat> 11 hospitals throughout the West Bank. They're saying that their hospitals would be able to cope with with the uh, with the uh, with the patients. They're also, by the way, relying on help from Israel. Right. We must not forget that since the beginning of this uh, crisis, Israel and the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank have been cooperating with each other. They even set up a joint central, uh, a joint command center. They call it of Israelis and Palestinians to coordinate uh, the fight against the uh, the disease in the West Bank. Israel has also been holding uh, uh, training sessions for Palestinian <clears throat> medical teams. They've been allowing Palestinian doctors and, phys and uh, nurses to come into Israel also to learn more about the uh, uh, ways of treatment uh, for the virus. Uh, uh, so there are good things happening on the ground. Now, of course, it's a mutual interest. Israel has an interest because uh, of the proximity of the West Bank to Israel and because uh, there are also many Jews and many soldiers and living in the West Bank and staying in the West Bank. This daily friction requires that there be some kind of a cooperation. And the good news is that there is cooperation. Now, the, in Gaza... <clears throat> They, according to the Ministry of Health over there, they only have 76 ventilators. But because of the low number, they haven't been uh, <clears throat> uh, expressing any kind of concern so far. Uh, they would like to see the uh, World Health Organization and other countries give them more ventilators. Uh, last week, Hamas appealed <clears throat> sorry, for 23 million uh, dollars in aid in order to uh, uh, bring in more medical equipment and ventilators into its hospitals. Uh, Israel helped or facilitated the delivery of some ventilators and some testing kits also uh, to Gaza. But so far, the situation in Gaza is under control. And that's also good news. It's sure. good news for Israel. It's good news for uh, people in the region, you know, Gaza is uh, one of the most densely populated uh, areas uh, uh, in the region. Uh, it's a very small place with too many people, and uh, mm -hmm. there was a lot of fear at the beginning uh, of a major outbreak. But now we see, you know, more than a month later that people are m much more calm and uh, uh, are less concerned. Uh, we even see people, you know, going out uh, to do their shopping. Uh, last week, a shopping mall, a new shopping mall opened in Gaza. And uh, hundreds of people flocked at the mall, uh, much, to the much to the dismay of, uh, of health officials over there. And uh, to a point where Hamas has even ordered an investigation now into that but uh, at least normal life is continuing in many ways in gaza right i've read uh, your article about that uh specific event and uh some of the people who you interviewed were saying that you know, hamas actually some members of hamas actually owned some of the stores in the mall and they forced it to open and then there was a backlash against it uh is there any truth to that of course of course i mean uh, you can't open a big shopping mall or a big project like that in Gaza without having connections with someone high up in Gaza. And uh, this, uh, the, the mall was opened at a time when Hamas was going around, closing down you know, restaurants and coffee shops and shops and, and, uh, and shopping centers and even mosques. Right. So the question is that people are asking in Gaza is how come, why did you allow this shopping mall, this specific shopping mall to open? Right. Why did you endanger the lives of many people? And then, you know, when they checked and they uh, 
made some inquiries, they discovered that some, many or some of the owners of this pr new project uh, are connected uh, to senior Hamas leaders who gave them the green light to open it. Uh, but again, that's an internal issue in Gaza. Right. Uh, Hamas is now under attack because of it. Now, you know, Job, we talked about the positive things happening between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Yes, mm -hmm. there is corruption. Yes, on the ground, you do, you do see Israelis and Palestinians working together. Yes, there is the joint uh, medical cooperation between Israel and the Palestinians, which is very good. Now, the bad news okay. is that despite this cooperation and despite all the help that Israel is offering and giving to the Palestinians, even to Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinian incitement against Israel has not stopped. We yeah. continue to see all kinds of cartoons uh, depicting Israeli soldiers as firing or, sp or deliberately spreading the coronavirus in Palestinian areas. Uh, we continue to read in the Palestinian media how Jews spread diseases in the Arab world among Palestinians. The Palestinian Prime Minister himself, Muhammad Ishtayyan, has twice, <coughs> uh, he has twice in public briefings claimed that Israeli soldiers and settlers walk around in Palestinian communities, spitting at cars and uh, uh, and uh, doors in order to spread the uh, virus among Palestinians. Then there was another conspiracy theory that said, oh, Israel is allowing workers or Palestinian workers uh, to return to, uh, to their homes in the West Bank uh, in order to spread the virus. Israel is doing it deliberately, and you know, all, all these, uh, all these, this kind of rhetoric, by the way, is very. It, it, first of all, it shows double standards, hypocrisy. Right. Because on the one hand, the Palestinian Authority is working with Israel; on the other hand, the Palestinian Authority is uh, inciting or at, against Israel, or excuse my expression, spitting at Israel at the same time. And uh, this is not very good because. Uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, incitement that leads Palestinians to take to the streets, to throw right. stones at Israelis, to, uh, to, to engage in clashes with Israelis at a time when Israelis are still uh, are helping the Palestinians and doing everything they can to help spread, prevent the spread of the uh, disease. And it hasn't stopped this Palestinian, this Palestinian incitement, which is not new, by the way. We've always known that it was there. I mean, I've personally been following the, uh, the Palestinian media for many years, and I'm very familiar with this issue. Uh, you know, it's a kind of a delegitimization of Israel and even demonization of Jews. Uh, and it's very bad because, uh, not only because it sparks clashes, between Palestinians and Israelis, but also because it destroys any chance of uh, uh, resuming a peace process in the future. Mm -hmm. If you keep telling your people the Jews are evil and they're bad, and the Jews want to kill us, and the Jews steal the land, and the Jews poison the water, and the Jews spread diseases, uh, how can you ever return to the negotiating table with Israel in the future? Well, do they want to return to the negotiating table? And that leads us to the last question. Well, we, the, the last thing we have time for is what, you know, what's the future? Will, do, you know, the, the door has been open to the Palestinians to come back to the table since the Obama, but, you know, the first o Obama administration. And really, there haven't been any serious talks. Uh, you know, we, we do have a prime minister as well here in Israel who, some people say don't don't want to talk peace either, um, but you know the door has been open and we haven't seen any serious talks. Is it what's what's the future of the Israel Palestine conflict? Look, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew. Uh, 
Right. And, but I can tell you what my thoughts are. And I've been telling them to many of your clients and your friends in, in many years, for many years. I'm one of those who say that if you want to make peace with Israel, you need to prepare your people for peace with Israel. Right. Period. It's as simple as that. If you want to make peace with Israel, you don't wake up every morning and tell your people the Jews spread diseases, the Jews poisoned Yasser Arafat, the Jews raped the woman, the Jews kidnapped the children. If you stop that kind of incitement, and you start preparing your people for the possibility possibility of peace, then I will tell you I'm optimistic we are moving in the right direction. But the way it looks now is that the incitement, the delegitimization of Israel is, has not stopped. It's, it's actually escalating even during this crisis. So how can we talk about the resumption of any peace process in the near future? Palestinian leaders continue to incite their people against Israel to a point where Palestinian leaders are unable to make peace with Israel. Right. Well, interesting stuff and interesting times. Khaled Abu Tomech, thank you so much. Um, it's always I always learn so much whenever I talk to you, whether it's in person with our tourists who come and visit or on the phone or just reading your articles in the Jerusalem Post. I highly suggest to everyone mm -hmm. listening to this to uh, to check out Khaled's uh, column in the Jerusalem Post. I think it's almost uh, daily. And Khaled, I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. And a shout out to Jonathan Rose in the background, our tech guru and Wendy Perrin, trusted travel expert for Israel for 2020. And we will we have a lot more uh, video podcasts uh, coming up. And please subscribe on our YouTube channel. Talk to you later.